Corporate governance has been a hot topic in the business world for centuries, even though the term itself is quite new. In the first of a series of lectures, Professor Bob Tricker, an expert in corporate governance, traces the development of the limited liability corporation and the powers and problems resulting from the separation of owners and managers. Here's lecture number one beginning now. I've given it the title, A Subject Whose Time Has Come. In other words, we're going to look at the evolution of corporate governance. A uh, half a dozen key ideas. First of all, that corporate governance is not new. Uh, secondly, uh, that it arises because of the separation of managers from owners. We'll look at the fascinating arrival and very important significance of the concept of the limited liability company. Then I'll take you through developments that took place throughout the 20th century. We'll see how they forced the codes of corporate governance good practice to arrive and then into developments over the, in the past few years. But you know there's nothing new about the corporate governance except the words itself. Corporate governance has existed as long as there have been corporate entities. Even Shakespeare knew about it. In the very first line of Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Act One, Scene One, we have the merchant, Antonio, saying, In sooth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I caught of it, how I found it, how I came of it, I know not. And his friend, Solerio, turns to him and says, your mind is tossing on the ocean. There where your Argus is with portly sail to overpeer the petty ships. The merchant has seen his wealth sail away over the horizon. He's had to leave the management of his assets to the captain and the crew. That's corporate governance. And corporate entities have always needed governing. So whenever ownership or in the case of a non-profit organization, the membership is separated from those who are running the enterprise, corporate governance is necessary. It was the case with Marco Polo. People had put money into his ventures, into China and India. As with the Merchant of Venice, it was the same with the 16th century sailing ship ventures. And similarly with the 17th and 18th century trading companies, like the East India Company or the Hudson Bay Company, which had been set up with permission to trade under the crown, under the permission of the King or Queen of England at the time. Once again, the investors putting their money into the entity found it necessary to leave somebody else in charge. That's a problem of corporate governance. Which brings us on to, to the beginnings of the modern focus on the subject, into the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were really only two ways of running a business. You could run it as a sole trader, somebody on their own, or you could run it in partnership with somebody else. But if the business failed, the, the creditors would look to you, the sole trader or the partners, for reimbursement. And indeed, they could take all your assets, including your home. And in those days, it was a criminal offense to become bankrupt, and so you would be sent to debtor's prison, and unfortunately, your poor family could find themselves in the workhouse. That was not a very good in incentive for people to invest in businesses unless they themselves could manage them. But this was the time of the Industrial Revolution. Businesses were growing fast. Opportunities were there. They needed more money than the plowback of the profits uh, would provide. And there were people out there, a new emerging rentier middle class, who had the money. <laughs> but they weren't going to invest it uh, in somebody else's business uh, if, on the chance that that business went bust, the creditors would come and take their assets. So there were major problems of raising new investment, right until the middle of the 19th century. 
then something quite dramatic happened. Something that was to change the whole future of business now around the world. It's the development of the Joint Stock Limited Liability Company, in which, as we can see, the owners, in this case of a limited liability company, the shareholders, sometimes called the members of the company, are separate from the company. 1855, First Companies Act, created an independent legal entity called the Limited Liability Company, separate from the owners. Separate, but with similar legal rights. A limited company, under the law, could buy and sell. It could own assets, employ people, contract and incur debts. It could sue and be sued. But the significance was that the liability of the shareholders, the people who put their money into the company to buy shares, their liability for the company's debts was limited to the equity investment that they intended to make. Companies had an existence independent of the owners. Their shares could be transferred, they could be bought and sold, they could be traded. The creation of the limited liability company opened up a whole new set of opportunities. And in fact, the very idea, it's one of the greatest ideas that man has ever come across. Uh, some would even say it rivals the wheel, or the discovery of fire, for changing the fortunes of the world. It has created, enabled the creation of enormous amounts of wealth, huge amounts of employment, and has changed the whole structure of the financial and business world since those early days in the middle of the 19th century. The underlying concept of the corporation is important. The underlying idea is that ownership is the basis of power. That's an important and key aspect of corporate governance. Modern corporation looks very different from the old original concept of a group of owners separate from a single company. But the basis hasn't really changed. Ownership is still the basis of power in the modern corporation. The directors are appointed by the shareholders. Shareholders in the early model would meet around the table, nominate and appoint the directors. The role of the directors then was to be stewards for the shareholders' interests. They had what we call a fiduciary duty, a duty to be honest, to act not on their own behalf, but on behalf of the shareholders, all of the shareholders equally. They were responsible to be accountable to the shareholders and would produce accounts uh, which the shareholders would receive, showing the stewardship that the directors had exercised over the shareholders' funds. In those early days, there weren't firms of auditors, as there are now. In those days, the shareholders would appoint one or two of their own members to audit the company, uh, audit the company's accounts. It was the job of the, of the directors to, be respond, to report to and to be responsible to the shareholders. That's the original concept. 